People are going missing all over North America under baffling conditions. In some cases, there are people where someone's looking right at them, they turn around, and then, you know, moments later, they're gone. Or in some cases, people will go missing and then are found again in locations that are impossible to get to. And so one man named David Politis, who's a former police detective, began investigating these very strange disappearances because nobody else was and he started compiling what he was finding in an absolutely fascinating book series called Missing 411. And so as I read through all of his books, I've begun pulling some of the more interesting cases that he details and highlighting them on this channel. Today, I'm gonna to focus on four instances of kids going missing after being in locked vehicles. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all I do when I upload three, four, even five times every week. If that's of interest to you, please throw the like button into the bottomless pit near Ellensburg, Washington, and also subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. On October 16th, 1930, John Sullivan, who was with his nephew, Lawrence Sullivan, who was only three years old, they were driving together in the middle of the Nevada desert. They were about 150 miles away from Reno in this very remote area. John was a gold prospector and he was heading to an area that he wanted to scout out and see if it was a proper place to prospect for gold. This area, the roads didn't even go to it. You had to drive down this road where it just kind of dead ends in the middle of the desert, right near this huge steep mountain range at which point you needed to park your car, get out, and then walk over this hill right in front of where the road ends. And it was gonna be over that hill, looking down into this valley where John wanted to prospect. So he drives down the road, he parks the car, and he turns to Lawrence and he says, hey, I'm gonna go over this hill for a minute and check the area out. I'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Stay in here, don't leave the car, I'll be right back. John gets out, he locks the car, he walks up to the top of the hill, and he turns around, looks at Lawrence, and waves at him. Lawrence looks up at his uncle and he waves back and he's smiling. So clear interaction. Lawrence knows where John is and where John's going. John can clearly see Lawrence. There's no one in the area too. I'm talking, this is remote as remote can be. You're just right up against this, this mountain. That's the only thing going on in this area. So John turns his back on Lawrence. He goes over the hill. He's now out of sight of the vehicle and he does a short inspection of this, this area that he wanted to prospect. He goes back up over the hill and he sees immediately that the door is now open and Lawrence is is not in the vehicle anymore. John is not immediately concerned because it's only been a couple of minutes. He can't have gone very far and there's nowhere to even go. There's no trees. I mean, basically it's just this mountain right here, but beyond the mountain, there's really nowhere to go. So he goes down, he looks in the car, he looks under the car, he's yelling for Lawrence, no response. And sound carried really well in this area. After a little while and he can't hear anything, he hasn't seen Lawrence, he's starting to get very desperate because they are in the middle of nowhere and the temperatures are gonna drop well below freezing at night. So John has to make this totally painful decision to get in his car and drive and get help. And so he leaves Lawrence because he can't find him. He gets help, the sheriff comes out there and they start this massive search for this child. This whole time, John is convinced someone had to abduct him because Lawrence knew where John was. If he was to get out of the vehicle, let's say, he would have walked over the hill to where John was. John was just on the other side of the hill. It doesn't make any sense that Lawrence would get out and wander in a different direction. He would have gone to John. They were very close. He might have wanted to see what he was doing on the other side of the hill. In the first few days of the search, they can't find any tracks of the child or another person that could have potentially abducted him or even tracks of an animal that could have potentially taken Lawrence away. There's just nothing. They did find his hat, but that was it. There's, there's no other evidence to go off of. And so after four days of searching, the newspapers began running headlines about potentially an eagle swooping down and taking Lawrence away because that's all anyone could speculate given the fact that there was no tracks anywhere and that his hat had fallen off. At this point, the police feel totally helpless. They don't understand how this child has managed to evade capture. They're not ready to accept that an eagle has taken him away. And so the police bring in a Native American tracker who was known in the the area as an exceptional tracker. So this tracker comes in and manages to pick up a partial trail of this child. 
and he starts following it and they get seven miles away from where this boy went missing. And the tracker begins going up the side of this cliff. They have to actually bring in climbing equipment to get up this cliff. They go 1400 feet up this cliff. So over 400 meters, they're going up this sheer cliff with climbing equipment. And they get all the way up there and there's this one little shelf, this one little rocky shelf that this tracker has brought them to. And sure enough on this shelf, is Lawrence and he's more or less unharmed. He's sleeping, but he's on this little shelf. He's tucked up against this tree. But interestingly, the tree had this bow that was fairly elastic and it had clearly been placed over his neck, basically trapping him tight up against the mountain. It was like he had fallen into a trap because the police said that had he moved suddenly, he would have broken his neck the way he was positioned. So the police carefully undo the branch and they bring the boy down, which was a total task considering how far up they were. And he's unharmed. He's a couple scratches on his face, but that's about it. They have no idea how he, one, got seven miles away and then over 400 meters up a sheer cliff. So 1400 feet up a sheer cliff that adults needed climbing equipment to get to. And then how did you survive the below freezing temperatures? You were out here for nearly a week. Nobody knows. On October 19th, 1973, James and Carol Duffy decide they want to go camping. So they have this big RV camper and they load up their two kids, Jimmy, who was two, and Natalie, who was a little over one years old. They load them in the RV along with their two cats and they take off for Lake Wenatchee, which is in the state of Washington. It's this beautiful campsite where lots of people with RVs would park right up against this lake. So they make it to Lake Wenatchee, they park their RV, they all get out, they're going on a little walk, but the kids seem fussy and so Carol and James decide to put them down for a nap. Carol takes the kids inside the RV. She puts them down for a nap. They're in there with the two cats. She shuts and locks the RV and goes outside. At this point, James says he wants to go scout for a good hunting spot around where they were camping. And so James takes off and he's looking for a place to go hunting. And Carol decides she's gonna walk a little ways around the lake, but keeping an eye on the RV the whole time. And also James was within eyesight of the camper as well. And after about 15 minutes, James goes back to the camper and checks on the kids. Carol would say she saw James doing that and kind of looked over to get the thumbs up from James to make sure the kids are okay. James goes in, the kids are sleeping, the cats are sleeping. James comes out of the camper, he shuts and locks it. He turns and he sees Carol. She's about 100 meters away, so a little over 300 feet away. He gives her a thumbs up and then actually walks over to her. So he's gonna go walk around with his wife now. So he makes it over to Carol and they're walking a little bit farther away. So they're still only about 150 meters away from their camper when they hear a scream coming from their camper. When they both turned around, there was a big tree kind of obscuring their view to the camper. So they kind of ran back on the path to get a better look at their camper. And all they can see is the door to the camper is now open. So the two of them sprint over to the camper. James gets there first, he goes inside and his son, Jimmy, is gone. Their youngest child, Natalie, was still sleeping and their two cats were still sleeping. Remember, Carol and James were on the other side of this lake about 100 meters away when they heard this screech coming from the RV. It seems odd that the cats and Natalie wouldn't wake up to that, but they didn't. After an initial frantic search of the area where they can't find Jimmy or any sign of Jimmy, they call the police, they show up and they begin doing a search themselves. And after two hours of aggressively combing this whole campsite, and talking to all the other people that were there, there wasn't that many people there, so they were able to interview everyone and everyone had an alibi, no one was near their camper. The police start to feel really suspicious about Carol and James. And in fact, they straight up accuse James of hurting his child and trying to cover it up. But James and Carol swear they were on the other side of the lake there, they heard that scream, they ran over, this is what we found. And so for four days, there's this massive search with canines, helicopters, you name it. They are combing the area, they are interviewing everyone they can. There is nothing, no sign of this child. And so the suspicion that Carol or James had something to do with the disappearance of this child only grew. And so eventually both parents were subjected to a polygraph test and both stuck to their story and both passed. They had nothing to do with the disappearance of their child. They were telling the truth. The police still felt like 
there's something off here about these parents. They must have had something to do with this. And so they really dug into their backgrounds and the family backgrounds, talking to friends and family. And every single person in this family's circle and even outer circle said, no, they care about their kids. They would never harm Jimmy. But through their digging, one thing that did come up is that Jimmy was actually considered a very frail child that basically couldn't do anything without assistance. So between the polygraph test that rules out the parents as being potentially responsible, and now this information that Jimmy was this very frail child, who's also two, right? He didn't get up, open the camper, escape, and then evade this massive search effort. You know, that, that didn't happen either. So all you're left with is abduction. But the police, they basically cordoned off this whole site and were able to account for every single person that was in the park at any time while the Duffies were there. And every single person had an alibi and completely checked out. Eventually, the search for Jimmy was terminated. And to this day, almost 50 years later, we still have no idea what happened to Jimmy, where he went, and how he got there. Late at night on March 26th, 1962, the Crawford family who lived in Tennessee noticed their one-year-old was sick, so they wanted to take her to the doctor's office. Mr. and Mrs. Crawford hop in the car with their one-year-old, and they bring along their three-year-old named Faye. They drive to the doctor's office. Turns out the one-year-old's gonna be just fine. They give the kids some medication. They head back to their house, and when they pull into the driveway, Mr. and Mrs. Crawford turn around. The one-year-old is awake but the three-year-old, Faye, is fast asleep. So the parents look at each other and they say, okay, we'll get the baby inside. We'll give Faye a couple more minutes to sleep inside the car and then we'll come out and we'll get her. So Mr. and Mrs. Crawford carefully get the one-year-old out without waking Faye up. They shut the door, they lock it, the windows are up. They go into the house, they put their one-year-old down and literally maybe a couple of minutes goes by, they come out and the doors are still shut, but Faye is gone. Now, because the vehicle was still shut, they're thinking, oh, she must have gotten out of her seat and maybe is tucked under the seats. So they run over and they look inside and Faye is nowhere to be found. She's not in the vehicle. So the vehicle itself had only two doors. There was two rows of seating, but only two doors. If you were in the back seat, like Faye was, you would need to push down, fold down one of the two front seats and then open that door to get out. But both door handles on the inside were broken off. They did not work. You would have to manually roll down a window and then reach out the car and use the outside door handle to open either door. So the parents are looking at the vehicle and the doors are shut, the windows are up, everything is still locked. And while it is possible that Faye could have, in theory, got out of her car seat, folded down one of the two front seats, rolled down a window, reached out, opened the door, got outside, rolled the window back up, push the lock down manually and then shut the door again, that is possible, it's extremely unlikely. And she had never done that. She'd never even gotten her own seat undone, let alone that complicated maneuver of getting out and reshutting the door and locking it. So obviously the police are called, they show up, they're searching the area, they can't find this child, and then it starts to snow and the temperatures start to drop. So the police and volunteers stay out all night. There is no sign of this child and the Crawfords are bracing for the worst. The next day around 11 a.m., three miles away from where Faye went missing, she walks onto the property of someone's house. She was barefoot, but she was more or less okay. Obviously the parents are elated. They're so happy their daughter's okay. Now, normally when somebody goes missing, the investigation stays open until they're discovered. If they're discovered alive, even if the circumstances are really weird, because they're alive, it more or less ends the investigation because what are you looking for at this point? They're found, they're alive, everything's okay. It's rare that an investigation would continue after they've been found. And in this case, the police left the investigation open because they couldn't understand how Faye could have gotten out of that vehicle, considering how difficult that would have been. And how did she get three miles away in less than 12 hours in the middle of the night, walking through a forest? Not to mention, historically, kids are creatures of habit. If they're missing and they're in the middle of the woods, but it's nighttime, they don't just keep walking. They lay down and they go to sleep. And then when the sun comes up, they get up and then they keep moving. So for her to have gone three air miles from where she went missing to this farmstead, that means she did not lay down and go to sleep. She kept walking all through the night. So none of it added up. And then when they asked Faye what happened, she would just smile and laugh. That's all they could ever get out of this child. So despite leaving the investigation open, 
No one ever came to any sort of conclusion about how she got out of that car and how she covered that distance or why. It's just a big mystery, like all of these missing 411 cases. In 2001, Paul Wayman was 37 years old. He was a construction worker living in Salt Lake City, and he was about to get divorced for the second time. In his first marriage, after the divorce, he got sole custody of their four children. He was a great father. The judge saw it that way and said the kids were better off with him. And following this second divorce, he would file for sole custody of the child that they had had together, who was a little boy, two years old, named Gage, and he would win. So Paul is a single father of five children. Gage was a lot younger than the other four kids, and so he kind of became Paul's little buddy and went everywhere with Paul. They were very, very close. On October 25th, 2001, Paul takes Gage, puts him in the back of his truck, he buckles him into his car seat, and the two of them head off to this area where Paul would hunt for deer. It was actually a private deer hunting area that was totally enclosed by a fence. Now, in order to access this private area, you needed to be a member, and Paul was a member, and once you become a member, they give you a gate code. And so Paul and Gage drive up, he gets to the gate, he punches in the code, he opens up the gate, the two of them drive in. He said he shuts the gate and locks it, and the two of them head up this path to this area where he planned to look for some deer. When he parked the car, he saw that Gage was passed out in his car seat and just did not look like he was gonna be psyched to get out and go look for deer. Paul thinks about it for a minute and he decides, you know what, I'm gonna leave Gage in the back seat. I'll just shut and lock the car. He's warm, he's taken care of. I'm gonna go spend just a couple of minutes looking for deer and then I'll come back and I'll get him. So he hops out, he locks the car and he walks a little ways away from the truck where it's still right behind him, but a couple of other hunters that were on this area, they saw Paul, they flagged him down and they started talking. He gets preoccupied and after 30 minutes or so, he realizes he needs to go back and check on his son. And when he goes back up, the front door on Gage's side is open and Gage is gone. Paul runs up to the vehicle. He can't believe that Gage is gone. Paul screams for the other hunters to come over and help him. He's like, I can't find my son. They start looking in the area and apparently Paul was so grief stricken. He began vomiting. He was totally hysterical and he kept saying, it's my fault. It's my fault. I left him here. Police show up and this massive search is launched. But you gotta remember that this is a gated in area. Everything is locked. You need to have a code to get in here. And the only people that apparently were on this site at the time were the other hunters that Paul was talking to. And so obviously that casts a huge spotlight on those hunters and Paul being responsible for whatever's happened to Gage. But initially they just focus on looking for this child. And after a little bit of searching and there's absolutely no sign of this kid, they do turn on Paul. He's like, you know what? If anything happened to my son, it's my fault. I left him in the vehicle, it's my fault. Like he's not being defensive at all. He is 100% saying, it's my fault, I did this. He's not saying I harmed my child, but he's taking full responsibility for whatever's happened. And the police pick up on that and they're like, you know what, I think he's telling the truth. And he's also saying that he was with those other hunters and they're the only other ones here. So for four days, this massive search is launched all over this hunting area, even beyond the hunting area, and there's no sign of this child. He's just gone. And so they terminate the search, but Paul's church offered to send another 150 volunteers to continue the search. And one of those volunteers was a man by the name of James Wilkes. He was an avid outdoorsman and he brought along his dog, Dino. And over the course of the search, James and his dog actually get lost, which David Politis says is very rare. There's so many people doing the search at one time, it would be hard to get lost, but it does happen. And so James and his dog wind up miles away from where they were supposed to be searching. They don't know where they are, they're lost. And so that night the temperatures are dropping, it's snowing, and James and his dog ended up getting under a tree in this little pocket under a tree and they huddled together all night. And James said it was one of the worst nights of his life. He didn't sleep much, but at some point in the morning when the sun started to come up, he was happy to be alive. You know, he didn't die of hypothermia. And he and Dino start walking. And they've only walked a couple of minutes when the dog stops and he starts licking something on the ground. And he looks down and under a couple inches of snow, it's the body of Gage. James scoops up the body and for hours, they start walking back kind of generally towards where he thinks he needs to go. He ends up finding a fence that he recognized. And since he was exhausted from carrying the boy, he placed the boy's body near a fence post that he knew he'd be able to recognize. And he and Dino made their way up to the search and rescue headquarters told them where to find the boy's body and, and, and they went back and they collected the boy's body. Now, because James is the one to find the boy, they immediately had to treat him like a suspect. They polygraphed him because 
you found the boy, no one else has found him, you're ways away from the search, but he passed his, his polygraph. James would say to police that when he found the body, there were all these tracks around the body. They looked like canine tracks, but they weren't Dino's. And he knows they weren't Dino's because he was holding onto Dino all night. And he hadn't been in this particular area the night before. So investigators are like, if there were other canine tracks all over that area, it means one, we searched it. But if we searched it, why didn't they pick up on the boy who they're trained to smell? Or what animal was this? Did it have anything to do with why Gage is here in the first place? After the autopsy, it was determined that Gage died from hypothermia. His father was absolutely devastated. You know, he spent all this time at the site where his body was found. He created a shrine for his son. He was known to spend hours in his vehicle trying to figure out how his son got out of his seat and then made his way out that front door, something he had never seen his son do. He was just totally devastated and he was ultimately charged with negligent homicide and he pled guilty to it and was given 30 days in jail. But before his sentence was carried out, he took his own life. So like all cases that David Politis covers in the Missing 411 series, we're left with a lot of questions and unfortunately they may never get answered. But that doesn't stop us from speculating. So please go in the comments and give me your best theory as to what's going on. How are these kids getting outside of these vehicles and winding up in places that seem impossible to get to? Not only will I respond to all the early commenters, the best theory will get pinned at the top of the comment section. If you enjoyed today's video and you wanna see more like it, please throw the like button into the bottomless pit near Ellensburg, Washington. And also please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. If you wanna get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username on both platforms is the same, John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion for this channel, please submit it on our subreddit, just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked below. I read it every day. So if I intentionally use your story suggestion, I will absolutely credit you. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, I'm just incredibly thankful for your support. And until next time, guys, that's going to do it. See ya.